everyone, welcome to this Sunday worship service of the First Congregational Church of Portland, Connecticut. We are open and affirming. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I'm Karen Reddick and I'm one of the deacons here at First Church and I'm filling in for Reverend Jane Hawking today as she is enjoying her new role as a grandmother. So we send our prayers and blessings to both Jane and David and their families in this very exciting time. Um, next week, Reverend Jane will also be away, and there will be a Sunday um, service on October 25th. It will be an outside Vesper service um, held by the Church Memorial Garden at 5 p.m. Um, this will be a moment of reflection and remembrance in honor of the 299th anniversary of the church's founding. Please bring your chair, or you can listen from your car. Um, guidelines for masks and social distancing will be followed. And if it appears that the weather may, be, um, may impact the service, you can contact George Law after 2 p.m. for any information about changes and or cancellation. But we'll keep our fingers crossed for a beautiful Sunday and we hope to see many of you there. If you would join me in a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless this day. Give us strength in these difficult times. Fill us with grace and kindness and mercy. Help us see our neighbors as heavenly zephyrs wafting down from the heavens. Help us see the beauty and the divine in each and every one of us. Our readings, our first reading today is from John 4, 7 through 19. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our second reading comes from Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Here ends the reading. In my 20s, I worked for a staff relief company. I moved around the country and lived and worked in different cities and towns. And I spent the better part of a year living in Greenville, South Carolina. When I was there, I had a colleague, a patient care technician who I had the pleasure of working with very often during this time. Her name was Phyllis. Phyllis was tall and she was large. She had a wide smile that flashed a gold front tooth. Her skin was brown and her eyes were bright. She laughed often and smiled constantly. We were teamed up many times and I was always glad to have her help. 
She made patients feel calm and comfortable. When she walked into a room, she was like that spray foam insulation. Her joy just bubbled and crackled into every crevice of the room. It made even the toughest day so much easier. I never had to ask for help. Somehow she was always one step ahead of me. And the first time we worked together, I remember her kind of looking me up and down, looking at my slight frame and telling me I needed to eat more. Maybe cake, she said and laughed. I told her I happened to love chocolate cake. And a few days later, she brought in a chocolate cake. And it was the most delicious cake I have ever tasted. And she also brought in her homemade sweet tea. When I asked her, I begged her, if she would share the recipe for each, she declined to share either. She laughed and waved me off, happy apparently to feed me, but happier still to keep her secret recipes. She won my heart that day with her cake and her tea, but most importantly with her kindness. A few weeks later, we were once again teamed up and we had a very difficult patient on our assignment. We'll call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith was an elderly white man who rang for assistance constantly. Sometimes in a frenzy of impatience, he would call several times in a row for different things and no sooner was one task accomplished on his behalf than he would call, bring his call light for something else. He would yell that I was late or that I had brought the wrong thing, say ginger ale instead of the fresh water that I know he had asked for. But it wasn't my place to argue with a man who was sick, so I would leave the room and get him fresh water and bring it back. His body was failing him and he needed help with everything and had patience for nothing. He was angry, and I would also guess scared. In the time he was on our unit, he never once had a visitor that I remembered. I don't even recall now if he had had family nearby or any family to speak of. On one particular afternoon, I was standing at the nurse's station just doing some paperwork when he rang from his room that he wanted to get back into bed. I think I sighed when I said to Phyllis, Ugh. We had just gotten him out of bed. And she smiled and she said, I got it. I told her I would be there in a minute to help her since she shouldn't go lifting patients by herself. But by the time I got to his room at the end of the hall, Phyllis was mid-lift, holding him as though he weighed no more than a newborn and gently placed him back into his bed. I put my hands on my hips and told her she could have waited. Well, she straightened herself up and she mocked my position and retorted, if I had waited for you, I'd still be waiting. She laughed at her own joke while she fluffed Mr. Smith's pillow. And as she moved away from the bed, Mr. Smith, who had been quiet to this point, raised his finger toward Phyllis and said, girl, you forgot my call button. I froze. I had never heard anyone call a grown woman girl. Phyllis was just about old enough to be my mother. I looked at Phyllis and for a moment something flashed across her face. It might have been anger, but it was quick and it was gone before I could really register it. She turned and gave him a tight and forced grin. She took the call button from the chair and put it in his lap and then walked out of the room, her head high with grace and dignity. I stood there staring at him for a moment. When I finally spoke, I said, her name is Phyllis. He waved his hand at me, dismissing me from his room, as was his habit. And it occurred to me only then that it wasn't just his use of the word girl that threw me, but that his tone was different. Believe me, he wasn't kind to me in any way, and his tone was full of impatience and anger all the time. But with Phyllis, there was an undertone, 
a clear delineation of where he felt he was in the social hierarchy and where Phyllis belonged. In the book, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown, the first chapter is titled, White People Are Exhausting. When I first read this, I was caught between saying, I hear you, sister, and bristling slightly, thinking, only white people? Which is why I think Miss Brown wrote this book to show how easily white people can and do disregard the experience of African Americans. I was stealing her experience from her before the first sentence. In the first paragraph of that chapter, Channing Brown writes, white people can be exhausting. Particularly exhausting are white people who don't know they are white and those who need to be white but of all the white people I've met, the first I found to be exhausting were those who expected me to be white. Reading this first chapter reminded me of that encounter with the angry old man and Phyllis. I had approached Phyllis later that day and told her she should complain to the nurse manager and maybe ask him to be removed from her assignment. She had waved me off and went about her work treating everyone as she always did with kindness and respect. I did not at that time understand, and I won't claim to being so much wiser now, but as a 27-year-old from Connecticut who only occasionally had an uncomfortable experience simply based on gender, I could not fathom what that moment felt like for Phyllis, nor did it occur to me that for her that was just a day in the life it did not occur to me that for her, that was not an isolated event. That more people had possibly referred to her as girl long before I came along and saw her as belonging in a certain place in society. I was expecting her to do something that as a white girl, I would not have thought twice about doing, speaking up. She knew much better than I could that that wasn't a battle worth fighting at that moment. In the story of Jesus and the woman at the well, we see Jesus interact not just with a woman, but with a Samaritan woman. Samaritans and Jews did not get along. Jews viewed Samaritans as a mixed race who practiced an impure half-pagan religion. Jesus talking with a Samaritan was shocking, treating her as an equal, very shocking. Christ was showing that love must transcend religion, race, class, ethnicity. Love brings about healing. What brings about prejudice at the root is fear, and fear and love do not work in tandem Think of fear as oil and water as love. Water is life-giving, isn't it? Water feeds the earth and humans and helps things to grow. Oil, when added to water, floats on top. It separates and doesn't blend. Yes, you can whisk it and it will combine, but as soon as you stop whisking the oil, as soon as you stop whisking, the oil pulls away. Fear is not an excuse for prejudice or racism. It doesn't excuse it, but it has to be acknowledged. Sometimes it is only what we don't understand that causes us to fear. To conquer this, it takes conversation and truth. Jesus was able to see the Samaritan woman in her humanity, not as someone who didn't believe what he believed, he didn't see her as a mixed race person. He saw her as a person. In the memoir, The Color of Water, James McBride shares his memories of growing up with his white Jewish mother in New York. He tells the story of his mother crying in church when he was very young. 
At the time, he thought it was because she wanted to be black like everyone else in the church, and maybe because God only liked black people. So he asked her if God was black or white. She said, he is not black, he is not white, he is a spirit. He pressed her further, asking if God loved black people more than white people. And she said, it doesn't have a color. God is the color of water, and water doesn't have a color. I love that image. I love the idea that God is not any one thing, but a piece of each of us. That in God's eyes, the only boundaries are the ones that have been man-made. We need to learn to see the divine in everyone. We need to look past fear and hatred and learn to see each other as God sees us. My grandfather wrote me a letter a few days after I was born, and in it he called me a heavenly zephyr, wafting down from the heavens. Isn't that beautiful? If only we could all see each other as heavenly zephyrs. How I wish Mr. Smith had been able to do that, to look past the color of Phyllis's skin, because if he had allowed himself to do that, he would have seen what a wonderful human she was. His life would have been richer for it. I have thought of Phyllis often over the years, especially when I make chocolate cake, because she did give me that secret recipe before I left South Carolina. She gave me a hug and whispered in my ear her secret ingredient. I have kept her secret all these years. But I have tried to share her joy and dignity everywhere I go. Amen. May the peace of God be with you. May you find good in your neighbors. May you look past the man-made boundaries to see the beauty that lies within each of us. May God bless you and be gracious to you. Amen. I will now read a call to the special meeting. The members of the First Congregational Church of Portland, Connecticut are hereby notified of a special congregational meeting to be held via Zoom video conference on Tuesday, October 20th, 2020 at 7 p.m. for the following purposes. To receive and act upon the minutes of the May 26, 2020 special congregational meeting and the subsequent electronic vote of the congregation. To receive the recommendation to install live streaming video technology in the sanctuary at a cost of approximately $10,000. To receive and act upon the recommendation for a congregational vote to be held electronically on the above stated purchase. To act upon any other business proper to come before said meeting. Respectfully submitted, Jeanette Hodge, President, and Marcy Clark, Clerk.